Thank you. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's a pleasure to be here. I've always enjoyed coming here and thank the organizers to, that they continue to invite me. <laughs> uh, so what I'm going to do today is um, just cover in the first part of my lecture some aspects of neurological memory. This, these actually you would have already heard from the wonderful lectures you've gotten this morning. But it'd be kind of reinforcing and repeating what you've already heard, but, but a little bit in a different context. Uh, I'll then show you actually some data. Uh, I've been given permission by the organizer that I can actually show some data after you've had, after you've become experts in immunology from the morning session. Okay. Uh, but I'll go through it uh, carefully and not overburden you. And then I'll just leave you with some comments about implications of protective immunity. Basically, I'll be repeating here pretty much what Claire Ann ended on. Okay. <clears throat> How do I move this forward? This thing is not. Yeah, I'm doing the green arrow, but not. Ah, okay, I got it. Yeah, I got it. Okay. Okay, as you have heard before, the first line of defense following vaccination or following um, an acute infection, that upon re exposure, the first line of defense for preventing infection and also reducing the overall burden of number of cells that get infected. So even if there isn't absolute sterilizing immunity, when you have pre-existing antibody, the number of cells that get infected initially are greatly reduced. So that has a big impact on uh, the disease being much less severe. So it is clearly the most important arm um, for protective immunity. And as Adam pointed out, uh, especially the one at the mucosal sites, antibody mucosal sites. Then the second line of defense, which is also very important is eliminating the virally infected cell because not every cell is protected from getting infected. And the best mechanism that we have of killing a virally infected cell are the cytotoxic CD8 T cells. These cells can go to every site of infection. They have the chemokine receptors and so on to get to sites of infection and kill the virally infected cell. So this is the typical hierarchy of immune responses in terms of protective immunity. But what about primary infection? What do you think plays a major role in clearing a primary viral infection? Remember, you would have no antibody before. So what do you think is a major contributor to controlling an acute primary viral infection? Innate response, yes. Innate response never clears the infection. Innate response always plays a role, whether it's primary or secondary, uh, and contributes to overall reducing the viral load. But it doesn't clear the virus infection. So what is the most important cell that clears the virus infection in a primary infection? Dendritic cells. Lymphocytes? B lymph? No. Dendritic cells? No. Macrophage. Macro, no. Uh, I just mentioned the cell, your killer cells, the cytotoxic killer cells. Okay. That is the primary, the main mechanism of initial viral control or uh, killing virally infected cells are the cytotoxic CD8 T cells. These cells are induced very rapidly within a week after infection. You will. Get, I'm talking about human data now. Within a week after infection, uh, within uh, you will have these cells generated. Within two weeks, you have you'll have a very high levels of these uh, cytotoxic CD8 T cells, huge numbers of them, uh, because these cells replicate very rapidly. You can get tenfold increases in numbers within a day once they start dividing. So you get massive increases in the virus-specific CD8 T cells, and these are the cells that bring about the initial viral control, killing the virally infected cell. Of course, antibody then later on comes up also by two weeks or so, you have some antibody coming up and then that also contributes to then additional cells being infected and, and gets it. But CD8 T cells are the key cells in controlling a primary viral infection. It's interesting that that came was your fifth or second, sixth choice. <laughs> Okay, so how do we, so in terms of antibody, 
Uh, you have seen this cartoon slide or something like this before, but I just want to emphasize here, um, how do you get durable antibody responses? To get durable antibody responses, you need to generate these long-lived plasma cells. So this is the course of a infection of vaccination. Uh, the vaccine activates the virus, vaccine-specific or virus-specific uh, B cells. Also, CD4 T cells are activated. So CD4 T cell help is essential for the proliferation and differentiation of the B cells. So these B cells will divide along with the CD4 T cells, so helping the B cells. Then you get activated B cells. And then some of these B cells will become plasma cells. So there's a, this bifurcation happens. Naive B cell starts dividing and proliferating. Then it makes a fate decision. If some cells remain as B cells, these will become your memory B cells and so on. But then some cells shut down the B cell transcription program and start secreting antibody, which is what we call a plasma cell. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the first phase is this generations, the split going into the memory B cell lineage and then some becoming plasma cells. This initial plasma cell response is actually before the germinal centers form. So this is a very important uh, aspect that is not fully appreciated. So this is actually extra follicular generation of plasma cells. because And this is the first antibody response that you get. When we do our measurements, we look at one week or two weeks, we have a lot of antibody after a good vaccine or infection. Almost all of that is coming from the extra follicular plasma cell response. Okay? That's what the rapid antibody secreting cell comes up. You can detect it in the blood very nicely. They secrete antibodies. And this is how also you get a good antibody response within, a two, within two to three weeks. And that's coming from these extra follicular plasma blasts. Majority of these cells are short-lived and will die. That's why you always see a big decrease in the antibody response. After every infection of vaccine, it's up and then it's down. It's down because these extra follicular short-lived plasma blasts will die within a few weeks. Okay. But then a subset, some of these memory B cells or some of these activated B cells will go into... I can't see my pointer. Oh, there it is. Okay. Will go into germinal centers. Now, here you will get more prolonged stimulation of the memory B cells in these germinal centers or activated B cells. Now, you get somatic hypermutation here. You will get also more memory B cells coming out. And then again, CD4 T cell help is essential here. And then from here, a subset of the plasma cells you get from the germinal center are the truly long-lived plasma cells. So plasma cell lifespan, even from the germinal center, is pretty heterogeneous. Some will live for maybe six months, some will live for a year because antibody levels and plasma cell numbers keep dropping. Okay, But then there'll be a small subset uh, that will become the long-lived plasma cells that reside predominantly in the bone marrow. So if you look at, a, at an antibody graph, it typically looks like this. This initial big increase, coming mostly from the short-lived plasma blasts or plasma cells. And then over time, this is over the first couple of years, this drop continues. Uh, sometimes it can be shallower, sometimes it can be this. I'll show you examples where actually it can, be, can become like this. But anyway, this is the cartoon slide, initial drop, and then a plateau. This plateau is due to the long-lived plasma cells that reside in the bone marrow. And this cell is a factory that just makes antibody. It has only one purpose in life, is to secrete antibody. 50% of the protein of plasma cells is antibody. They don't divide. It has no replication capability. They also cannot be stimulated by antigen because they do not retain immunoglobulin on the cell surface. The B cell receptor is the immunoglobulin. B cells retain it, so you can stimulate with the antigen. Plasma cells especially the long-lived plasma cells in the bone marrow, have no surface immunoglobulin. So you cannot stimulate them, but they're a factory that will continuously make. The bone marrow provides the nurturing environment for these cells, so you can have uh, longevity of these cells for decades. These cells can live for decades. 
So this is what happens when you get a booster or a reinfection. Again, antibody levels come up, they drop, and sometimes they plateau above what is here. Okay. So where is this? So who's responding to this? When you give a booster shot or you get reinfection, where is this antibody coming from? What are the cells that participate in this? Memory B cells, of course, they now again become plasmoblasts. Some of them short-lived, some will be longer-lived, okay? And CD4 T cells, because they get activated and provide the help that's needed. So CD4 help is needed at both stages, primary and secondary. Okay? What about the plasma cells? Do they do anything when you do the booster? No, I just told you they don't, because they don't have the B cell receptor, and they cannot replicate. Okay, just a few comments about how antibody works. I think you've heard this. Neutralization is by far the most efficient mechanism that is binding to the antibody, so it cannot bind to the binding to the viral pro surface protein, so it cannot bind to the receptor. But also there are FC-mediated functions which are important, opsonization, ADCC type activities, complement. Opsonization and complement very important, especially for bacterial infections. The primary mechanism antibody work with bacteria really is opsonization, phagocytosis, and complement. Okay. Um, a few comments about the different uh, IgG subclasses. So there are four IgG subclasses, IgG1, IgG2, IgG3, IgG4. Uh, they differ in many things, but in particular, they have different FC receptors. So some are more efficient and some are less efficient. And that's shown on the next slide. This also shows you the concentration. So in our, in the human serum, IgG1 is the most, is the most predominant, uh, IgG. IgG2 is next. IgG3 is next. IgG4 is next. This is one of the rare examples where the nomenclature makes sense. Okay? <laughs> because it was done by biochemists, not by immunologists. They looked at the gel and they saw, okay, this is the highest is IgG. So they went the highest concentration, IgG1, 2, 3, 4. Very nice. Okay. Um, what I want to point out is that in terms of uh, FC-mediated functions, IgG3 actually is the best. Then IgG1 is also very good. IgG2 has less. And IgG4 actually has minimal to no FC function. Okay. And so if you are looking at an infection or a vaccine, which is generating a lot of IgG4, it's probably not such a good thing. It's also not very good in neutralization. IgG4 is more of a regulatory antibody. You see it in allergy, you see it in chronic infection settings, parasitic infections. So you really, what you really want are IgG1 and 3 or also IgG2. You really don't want IgG4. Okay, a few comments about T-cell immunity. I told you CD4 T-cells are essential for antibody health, but they also have antiviral effects and antibacterial effects. They secrete interferon gamma and other cytokines, so they play both roles. CD8 T cells are single-minded killer cells. Okay? They have one function in life, which is to kill the virally infected cells or any intracellular pathogen. And how do these responses look like in terms of kinetic? Again, very similar thing. There's an up, a down, and then a plateau. The up is there because you get this incredibly fast generation of effector CD4 and CD8 T cells. And then about 90% here, the numbers are very precise because we and others have done good quantitation, less good quantitation of plasma cell numbers over time. But certainly here, about 90 to 95% of the activated effector cells will undergo apoptosis within the, within the next uh, several months, uh, which is good because you expand your T cells so much. Also, you expand your plasma blast so much that you have to cull the numbers down. Otherwise, we would have permanent lymph lymphadenopathy and splenomegaly. You have to kill the majority of the effector cells that you generate. So this is part of the immune response. The up and the down is important. Otherwise, to maintain homeostasis. And then here again, about 1% to 5% of the cells are long-lived memory uh, CD4 and CD8 T cells. And these can be found in the circulation. They can be found in the blood. They can also be found in both lymphoid and non-lymphoid tissues. When they're in non-lymphoid tissues, they're referred to as tissue resident memory cells. 
So basically, you've got the T cell compartment is covering both circulation and surveillance, but is also at potential sites of infection. It can also be at the mucosa. So how do memory cells differ from a naive cell? So it differs in uh, several uh, respects. One is that the lifespan of a memory cell can be very long. Many examples of memory cells that were induced by an infection or vaccine persisting 10 years or 20 years or even 50 years later. People who got the smallpox vaccine, you could still detect a low frequency of memory CDA T cells in the blood even 30 or 40 years after vaccination. You see the same thing with the yellow fever vaccine. Most acute live acute viral infections and attenuated viral vaccines will give you very long-term T-cell memory that will last for decades. The reason that these cells last for decades is two. One is that they are capable of a slow homeostatic proliferation, This, which is antigen independent. These cells proliferate maybe once. We did this study with yellow fever vaccine and showed that the proliferation happens maybe once a year or once every year and a half. Okay? And this compensates for the loss that might be happening. So this homeostatic proliferation uh, maintains the numbers. Okay? And this is due to two important cytokines, IL-15. IL-15 is important for the slow homeostatic proliferation and also IL-7, which is important for the survival of the T cells. So T cells ex that are long-lived will always express the IL-7 receptor which is CD127. That's a hallmark. If this T cell doesn't express CD127, it's going to be a dead cell very soon. Okay. So these memory cells express high levels of IL-7 receptor, which survival is increased, and IL-15 receptors for the slow homeostatic proliferation. But then they have one other remarkable thing. They can express effective functions very rapidly. So for a naive cell to become a killer cell expressing killer molecules like granzyme B and perforin, it takes several days because they have to proliferate and then they have to differentiate. But a memory cell is poised with its chromatin open to immediately express these effector molecules, even without dividing. So within hours, if it's at the site especially, it would be immediately active. So they are programmed to express effector functions very rapidly. And again, that's the importance they, they contribute, again, to protective immunity for those reasons. And I want to end here by repeating what I've said. is a very important distinction between B and T cell memory. So B cells undergo affinity maturation of the B cell receptor. And this happens, again, in germ-rich centers. Okay. So you now get a antibody with much higher affinity to the antigen. And this increase actually is significant, can be tenfold or hundredfold. So in a recall setting, you end up getting much higher affinity antibody than during a primary infection. So the B cell receptor changes to become, pro produce and become a much higher affinity antibody. But there is no affinity maturation of the T cell receptor. The T cell receptor in a naive cell and in a memory cell is exactly the same T cell receptor. But the insides of that cell are very different. In the case of a naive cell, it takes a, several days to become an effector. In the case of a memory cell, immediate effector function upon seeing the antigen. And that's because the chromatin is very different. Some of the transcriptional factors are different, again, ready to be expressed that will result in this. So this epigenetic marking that happens during the early stage is retained in memory cells for decades. It's quite amazing. Methylation marks, histone marks, open close chromatin, these changes that happen at two weeks after the infection, when the T cell is being activated, those epigenetic marks are retained for decades. Okay. The protein is no longer made that because there's no stimulation T cell receptor, but as soon as they see the protein, the, 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 the peptide and the image class one, they will very quickly express effector molecules. Okay. How much time do I have left? Five. All right. So I'm going to go through this very fast. Okay. A lot of data. I'll skip, skip, skip through the data. Okay. And give you the bottom line message. Okay. So we did a study to look at uh, 
immune memory to COVID-19. The study involved about 250 convalescent patients uh, who have now have been followed. I should update this slide. They've been followed for much longer now. Okay, But I'll show you data out to about 18 months. All of these people were enrolled in our study in early 2020. So they were all infected with the Wuhan strain. And this was before any vaccine was available. So we are following the longitudinal immune responses of people infected with the Wuhan strain. And our cohort was in two sites, Atlanta and in Seattle. And majority of these people had mild to moderate PCR confirmed were well, non-hospitalized. In some ways, they reflected what happened to the majority of the people. Uh, so we looked at, uh, oh, this is just to remind you what it is. The reason is I'm putting this up, you've all seen it. But what I want to point out to you is that this is a very large protein, the spike protein, about uh, 1,273 amino acids. This important region, this RBD region, is the receptor binding domain, which is about 200. Most, when the variants have come up, most of the changes happen in the RBD region. So, for example, the Omicron variants had about 40 mutations in this uh, RBD region. And that resulted in the neutralization not happening with the Wuhan-induced antibodies. Okay. But the other reason I showed this slide is that the even though the Omicron had these 40 mutations in the RBD region, which abolished neutralization, 90, that was only 3% of the spike protein. So 97% of the spike protein between Wuhan and Omicron is identical. Okay. And that's one of the reasons you will always be getting antibodies that are cross-reactive and very confusing. Okay? So the, remember that they are still highly conserved in the spike protein, but the key regions have mutated. Okay? All right, so let me now go back to this. I'll go through this very fast. Okay? Uh, so we looked at many things, binding antibody, uh, neutralization, uh, memory B cells 4 and CD8. Okay? So this is our binding antibody data. I'll just spend a few minutes on this panel. So this is looking longitudinally. And each of these individuals, we have about six to eight time points. So this becomes a very robust analysis within a given individual of the longevity of the antibody response. It's not cross-sectional. Everything is longitudinal. In the red here is uh, our serum samples from our earlier studies done for other reasons, pre-pandemic samples. So this is how we set the negative. This was samples from 2003 to 2010, pre-pandemic samples. And they're flat lines, obviously. So they have no antibody to SARS-CoV-2. Antibody comes up, and then it kind of comes down. And we did the, this decline over this eight months uh, period, or this two, uh, period two ways. One, we did exponential decay, which is this black line. So exponential decay gave us a half-life of about 125 days. But then our statisticians also did what's called a biphasic decay, which looks at, is it flattening? So this is using a power law method, and that is green one. And you can see that this one now is kind of slowing down. And that's what I told you. There is a drop, but then it starts kind of plateauing a little bit, because now you're getting some contribution from the longer-lived plasma cells. And if you do the analysis, it's the exponential decay one, which fits better, the, sorry, the, which the power law method fits better than the exponential. A lot of IgA is also made uh, after infection. We did not measure in the mucosa, but IgA is induced by infection. Very effectively, IgM comes up and goes down. Neutralizing antibody also comes up, and again, by the exponential decay, you have a 250-day slope. Correlation between antibody and binding. This is the memory B cell response. Memory B cells are very stable. This one, interestingly, we didn't see much of a drop in this window uh, and very stable response, so at least for this period. This could be because more memory B cells coming from general centers. CD4 responses are also reasonably stable, at least in this window. Cells are very highly functional. So very functional CD4 TH1 cells you get. CD8 responses also about 200 day half life, and as shown by function highly functional. So you get highly functional CD4 and CD8 T cells, which are kind of persisting over this uh, the eight month or ten month period, and actually they persist longer. Just want to spend a few seconds on this one. 
is we were measuring responses over the entire SARS-CoV-2 genome, not just spike. And what we found was that if you look at recognition by CD4 T cells, they recognize epitopes coming from the spike protein, from the envelope and the matrix, the nucleic capsid, and a couple of these open reading frames. So very broad CD4 response, recognizing pretty much all of the uh, genes that we looked at. CD8 showed an interesting pattern. What these showed is that you also have recognition of uh, spike one and two, the epitopes in the spike region, is in the effect envelope and matrix, but a real bias towards getting higher epitopes or higher responses to the nucleic capsid protein. And this, what this is telling us that in, that an infected cell is expressing a lot of CD8 T cell epitopes on the surface, CD8 peptides come, you know, uh, uh, peptides coming from the nucleic acid. So the nucleic acid is a very good target for CD8 responses. So one of the recommendations based on these studies one would make is that one could consider including the nucleic acid also in the, in the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, because this will give a little bit better CD8 responses. It won't be of any help in terms of antibody, but it will broaden uh, the CD8 cells which are there for killing the virally infected cell. I see a standing, so I will quickly um, show. And now we have gone out longer, and you can see that this is flattening out. So this is now out to almost uh, one and a half years. And you see that now this is now becoming, the it really has flattened out. So the half-life now is a thousand days. So the infection definitely is generating some long, long loop plasma cells. Okay. And this is kind of beginning to plateau, like around the one and a half to two year period. Okay. I will, um, and these also persist. Okay. I think I will end here. Okay. And I'll tell you what the, the part that I'm going to uh, skip. Okay. Let me just go to the conclusion slide. I'm going to skip all of these. Okay. Okay. So what I skipped very quickly was asking the question about uh, neutralization of the Omicron variant. And you've all seen papers and you've read uh, newspaper articles, primary uh, publications showing that antibody induced either by the Wuhan vaccine or by the Wuhan infection, and we found that in our cohort, neutralized Wuhan very efficiently, also neutralized Delta quite efficiently, but had very poor or no neutralization against Omicron BA1, BA2, or BA5. So we were then able to look, we were very lucky, we got uh, from the CDC, we got about 150 samples of uh, patients who were hospitalized and infected either with the Delta or with the Omicron. Okay. And some of these people had been vaccinated and some of them had not been vaccinated. And what we found was that in people who were infected with the Delta strain, hospitalized, and were naive, they made very high antibody response to Delta, tremendous neutralization Delta, and also Wuhan. But Wuhan was lower, significantly lower. Good one, but the Delta infection induced a response which was most reactive against Delta, pretty good against uh, Wuhan. Okay but absolutely minimal to no neutralization of BA1, BA2, or BA5. And, but in the patients who were vaccinated with Wuhan and then infected with Delta, there we saw equivalent antibody response to the Wuhan and to Delta. Okay? Because now you are recruiting some of the memory B cells induced by the Wuhan vaccine and was equally cross-reactive for Delta and for Wuhan. Okay. So what about Omicron? Omicron was very interesting. The Omicron titers in general were slightly lower. I don't know why, but they were slightly lower. Okay. But they were much more cross-reactive. Okay. And especially in the people who were vaccinated, and the majority of the people, majority of the hospitalized patients from Omicron actually were already vaccinated. Because by then, by the time it emerged, many had been vaccinated. In those, we saw interesting patterns. But the bottom line message was that if they got the BA1 or BA2 infection, they had much better antibody responses to BA1, BA2. I'm talking about neutralizing antibody. 
They also had antibody responses that went up against the Wuhan and the Delta. But the ratio of antibody, neutral antibody to Wuhan versus Omicron was much more favorable in people who got the Omicron infection. And then we also looked at people who got the BA5 infection. And there, again, BA5 was higher than BA1, BA2. So even within the Omicron variants, BA5 infected people made better responses to BA5 compared to BA1, BA2. And it was the converse in people infected with Omicron, BA1, BA2, better to BA1, BA2 versus BA5. But still much better to the Omicron lineage compared to what Wuhan and Delta did. So I think the, the main message here is, I think that that this is what I've is written over here. Okay. Um, so I think you definitely want the Omicron uh, variant in your vaccine. Uh, the question becomes, do you want to also include the Wuhan strain? And I think that that's an interesting discussion, whether that's even needed, whether we should just be going with the existing strains. Okay. So I, and I think we will have to keep the new variant will most likely emerge from the virus is circulating, so we should be prepared and be protecting us, ourselves against uh, the uh, Omicron variant. Okay, I'm going to skip this slide because Clara has told you very nicely that protection from infection is very difficult, even though it might reduce the overall number of infected cells and number of people. Okay, and I just want to, since I showed you a lot of data, I should acknowledge the people who did this, and in particular, the patients. Thank you. That's it, that me. I, I just have a quick question. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. In the what you just said about the Omicron, do you have naive people uh, infected with Omicron that were not vaccinated? Could you compare? Or? Yes, we could. And again, it was um, in in the naive people. Again, the the best response is to the Omicron. Okay. You also get neutralization of some neutralization of the of the Wuhan and the Delta, but again, the highest is to the Omicron the infecting strain. Yeah. Okay. Open for questions. I have one here, one there, and one there. Okay. Go ahead. Um, and you read from Thailand. Um, I would like to get your opinion on hybrid immunity. If you start with vaccine and then infection versus you infection and then you get booster vaccine, are there any differences in terms of immune response that will elicit it? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, so if you get, but there are some interesting differences, okay? So if you get infected first, you make a very broad response. You're making a response to pretty much multiple uh, epitopes, CD4 and CD8, and you're making a response to the spike protein, which would be very similar to what the vaccine would give you. Now you boost with the vaccine, and you get, and the data is out there, actually is very beneficial. So people who are infected, who get the vaccine, always showed better protection than people who are only infected. Okay. So you will now greatly increase the level of the spike antibody because I showed you memory B cells, very high frequency of memory B cells are generated after infection. Many of them reactive to the spike protein. So you will get a fantastic recall response from those. So that has been shown to be uh, quite nice. People who were first vaccinated, uh, of course, would have antibody to the spike protein, CD4 cells to the spike protein. If it was an mRNA vaccine, some CD8s also. But if it was an inactivated vaccine, you wouldn't have any. If it, if it was the adenovirus vaccine, the AstraZeneca, then maybe even slightly better CD8s. Uh, uh, now you get infected, uh, and I think it would boost all of those responses. Pre-existing ones will get boosted, but also new ones will be generated. Because now you will generate uh, uh, T-cell responses, also antibody responses to the many other viral proteins. Okay. But that would depend greatly on the level of infection. If the vaccine was very effective, which we are hoping in, and in many cases was, then the overall stimulation of the immune system will be not as great because the antigen drives the response. The more the antigen, the better the response is. So if you're in, if you had, if your vaccine was kind of a little bit ironic, but that's what the data is. Okay? So if your vaccine was very effective, 
in immediately controlling the infection, then the boost from the infection is not that great, which is fine. It was fine. I think there's nothing wrong with that. You want to be protected. <laughs> but I'm telling you what the immunology is, okay? <laughs> so the responses after a primary uh, are always greater because of that. You know. but, the, but the boosting of the antibody is great because you have so many mem- So if, you're, if your focus is on the antibody, the spike antibody, vaccinated people after infection made beautiful spike antibody responses and vice versa. That is infected first and then vaccine. So both are very beneficial. So how, how do you think that is applied for healthy children? Because in many countries, they're not recommended vaccine for healthy children because they think that with natural infection and then after that. I would never healthy. recommend natural infection for anyone. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Yes, question here. Um, Hi, Anna. Uh, so in your data on the natural infection and the, the immunity that, that's uh, as a response to the infection, you showed the CD8 uh, uh, and CD4 T cell data, yeah. and those are all, always proportionally so low. Um, is that compared no, to... It's not, no, it's not. It, no, it's the fee, I can, yeah, I went through very quickly. So the frequency of the CD4 responses are about half a percent to one yeah, percent of the CD4 cell, which is very respectable. And the CD8s were pretty. Uh, CD8s, interestingly, CD8s with this are lower. Yeah. Which is very interesting. And I don't know the answer for that because we, uh, we study CD8 T cells for, that's the main focus of the lab. And we have looked in many human viral infections, uh, especially yellow fever and vaccinia. We've done very detailed studies. And also we have looked at EBV and CMV, you know, these other things we have also looked at. In all of these, the CD8 responses are greater than CD4s. This is the first time yeah. that we have studied <laughs> an infection where it's a little bit flipped, that the four responses are slightly higher than the eights you get. I mean, it's easily measurable after infection, but the ratio is different. I don't know the reason for it. And then there are some individuals who have a very high CD8 response. You know, There's a lot of variation. Eight. Yeah. Uh, There's a lot of variation there. The spread is quite a bit that yeah. you can have up to about tenfold variation. We didn't have good viral load data. So we, uh, I have a feeling it probably is a reflection of the level of infection, but we did not have that data in these individuals. Yeah. It's sort of also true for vaccine response. It's quite heterogeneous. Yes, yes. 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 Yeah. From here. Um, From here. When you say the cross neutralization of the strains, uh, Omicron versus one versus Delta, what is the kind of, um, you know, cross um, you know, uh, variation or the cross pro, uh, neutralization in terms of the assay that we are doing, the neutralization assay. Is there also a you know, crosstalk between the different strains that we use? And how does that affect the overall performance? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So we've uh, done the, everything I showed you for was a live neutralization assay. And uh, Mehul Sutter, uh, whose name was on the acknowledgement, he's kind of, uh, really optimize this live neutralization assay. And it's been, he's been the one doing all the neutralization actions for Moderna and many other people. So it's a very standardized, he's put a lot of effort into standardizing the assay. The point was made, I think, by Adam or, or Andy that that's a tricky assay, but Mehul has really put incredible effort in standardizing it. So, and then he's also put a lot of effort when he's using the different strains for infection, because again, you have said live neutralization, so you have to take that into account. So we have been, or I should say, Mayor has been very careful in doing these assays. Yeah. Thank you. The back here. Yeah. You, <laughs> sorry, I don't, don't know your names. No, it's okay. uh, I'm Trina from Canada. I was just wondering if you could comment on the role of memory cells in broadening an immune response, because we saw after, you know, three doses of Pfizer and Moderna, they were, we were seeing more broadly protection against some of the variants. So just yeah, I mean, I think there. we haven't done these, but a lot of very nice studies have been done by several groups. You certainly do increase somatic hypermutation upon the, the boosters which are given. Uh, so, and I think you're getting higher affinity antibody, certainly after the second shot of the vaccine. And there's a lot of papers showing, you know, the way monoclonals and looked at the uh, neutralization uh, efficiency of those of these monoclonals, and certainly you get uh, better antibody uh, after the boosting. 
And also in infection, it improves over time. Again, others have shown this. One question here. Okay. Maybe I missed it. Uh, so um, what are the, the results depending on the category of age? So are there... We, we did not pick... Yeah, our... So that's a good question. So our cohort, uh, we don't have too many elderly in our cohort. So most of our cohort is between uh, 20 years and 55 to 60. Okay. Between that group, we didn't see anything. Um, people over 70, 75 are very few. So we couldn't get any reliable data. Uh, so we couldn't get any reliable data on the, on the elderly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe just one. Uh, can I? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, just uh, I mean, on the concluding slide, I think it's um, you had these findings uh, pretty much along the lines for the ancestral strain, right? And then you also added a comment on the BA.5, right? So, but now with this new VCVs and the bivalent vaccine, right, is that changing the dynamics in terms of the stimulation that we're seeing? Uh, or is there any sort of, could look into it with the, with the introduction of the new uh, bivalent vaccines? Uh we don't have in our lab, we don't have bivalent vaccine data, but several others have published. Okay. So again, I think the, with the bivalent vaccine data that I've seen, you, it is beneficial in increasing the risk antibody, neutralizing antibody to BA5. Some, the data is, I think, not as striking, uh, because it's a single dose and you may need an additional dose to kind of boost those more Omicron specific ones. Ours was infection, so more antigen. And these were also hospitalized patients, so they were sick enough. So here, clearly, uh, we got a very nice neutralizing antibody response to the infecting strain. One question there, and then we go in the back. Thanks. Hi, this is Jen from Singapore. Um, it's related to specific, for example, if the vaccine design has a multiple has an ability to show multiple immune response, such as innate response, humoral response, and also cell-mediated, including the CD8 T cell. So what would be your advice uh, from, from your um, expertise to explain all these multiple immune responses to explain the vaccine efficacy? Because it's starting from innate and also including the clearance of the virus. So uh, it's really difficult to really um, show the multiple phases embedded and explain it to efficacy. So what would be your advice? No, I, let me make sure I understand your question. So you're talking about the vaccine inducing these responses, right? Yes, right. which is true. The vaccine, uh, whether it's protein plus adjuvant or the mRNA vaccines or the ad vaccines, you know, they will push some innate buttons. So you will get good innate responses. Uh, and that is needed to generate good T and B cell responses. And so then the vaccine generates T and B cell responses, and those persist to varying degrees. So the protection is really coming from the adaptive response. And again, it's not coming from what happened in the, in the first uh, week or two, which would be the innate response part. Does that answer your question? So um, this is, um, if, let's say we have all the multiple immune responses together, including the innate and also the cell-mediated plus the neutralizing antibody. So in that case, it's really multiple arms of response, which... Uh, in terms of protective immunity, it would be coming from the adaptive immune response. Uh, and I think um, Andy might be able to answer this better because he's, they've looked at correlates and so on. Uh, but I think everyone agrees that the antibody is clearly playing a major role in protection. Uh, and uh, what the contribution is of the cellular immune response, I'm not sure if the correlate data is there. But based on work we and many others have done in both human infections and also in uh, uh, preclinical models, the CD8 T cells and also CD4 T cells play major roles. CD4 T cells in terms of providing more antibody after the infection and CD8 T cells directly killing the virally infected cells. Okay, last yeah. question. Yeah. Thank you, Rafi, uh, <clears throat> for clarifying so many doubts. I have two brief questions. One is this issue, does the delivery of antigen make a difference? So if intradermal delivery of the antigen is given, does it make a difference in terms of type and yeah. quality of immune response? And the second question is, 
your comments on this original antigen sin. Yeah, okay. So the first one, I mean, as you know, Narendra, uh, over the years, many, many studies have looked at inter- comparing intradermal versus intramuscular uh, deliveries. And I'm not sure what the conclusions were from those studies. Maybe others in the room, maybe, even, but I've never been able to, uh, from looking at those papers or reading or hearing the talks, come to a clear conclusion saying that intradermal is better than intramuscular or vice versa. For protein immunization, of course, if it's a live infection, it's different because if the virus is replicating in the skin, then of course, the, as you know, with smallpox, you have to give it that way. Yeah. But in terms of a protein immunization, I'm not sure where the jury is on that one. Okay. Uh, so in terms of your second question, yes, that is what basically, I didn't use that term, original antigenic sin. I also did not use the term imprinting, you know, <laughs> but basically I think of it as a recall response of the pre-existing memory B cells. So when you, uh, in most, in almost all cases, when you already have a person who was infected before with the Wuhan strain or had gotten the Wuhan vaccine, two or three doses, and then they got the Omicron infection, almost all of the response comes from the pre-existing memory B cells. There's a beautiful paper that just came out recently from Ali Ali Bedi, uh, where he looked at a large number of uh, monoclonal antibodies. Pretty much all of them are recalled. Very f- hardly any are coming from naive B cells. Not that you cannot recruit a naive B cell that's only seeing those mutated 42 amino acids, but the competition of, from the memory B cells so outnumbers those naive B cells that you basically will see a recall coming from cross-reactive memory B cells. So the good thing about using the variant is that it will certainly recruit B cells which were probably at a very low frequency after the Wuhan that were cross-reactive, those then expand. So there is selective expansion of the cross-reactive memory B cells. But you can, uh, maybe upon more than one immunization, you might be able to get naive B cell responses. And I'll give you one example where we showed this very nicely. And this was a study we published a few years back. And this was vaccination of humans with the H5 influenza vaccine. So this was a study where H5 vaccine was used with the GSK ASO3 adjuvant and were given to healthy young adults. And they were all, of course, seropositive. And it was two shot uh, days, day one and then day 21. So we analyzed the antibody response after the first shot and then after the second shot looking at plasma blasts, memory B cells, making monoclonals, looking at the, the reactivity and looking at somatic mutation. And what we found was that after the first immunization, almost all of the response was restricted to the stem region of the HA. But this region is conserved between H1 and H5. And this response came exclusively from the pre-existing memory B cells. There was a high level of somatic hypermutation, uh, and and these were all reactive to the stem. But after the second immunization with H5, now we saw generation of head reactive that is seeing the H5 head, which is very different from the head of H1. It's not 97% similar. It's very different. But 40-50% differences between H5 and H uh, and H1. Okay? And now we see naive B cells coming up okay, with very minimal somatic hypermutation and reacting with the with the head region of H5. So here you're seeing both OAS and you're seeing generation of a uh, response from naive B cells. Thank you. Great. Thank you.